Hello. Hello. Can you hear me now? How about now? You can't hear me? Why? Because this is a freaking laptop battery. Welcome everybody, my name is Marky Shaw. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video on the Zenith SuperSport 8088 laptop. It's a machine from the 1980s, and yes indeed, that is the battery that comes along with this thing. All you have to do is prop it up like so. Snap it into place. And 25 pounds later, you have yourself a perfectly portable laptop. Let's take a closer look at this thing. Zenith created some innovative products back in the 80s, and it turns out they have a really cool history, too. Zenith Data Systems was actually a division of Zenith Electronics that was formed in 1979 after they acquired the company Heathkit, which my ham radio buddies should know all about. They made electronics testing equipment, hi-fi home audio gear, and of course a variety of amateur radio equipment and kits. So having the skills of the Heathkit company on board with Zenith, they were destined to make some pretty awesome computers. Many will say that Zenith pioneered the laptop industry in the 80s thanks to being one of the first manufacturers to include hard drives in their laptops like the Zenith 181 and 183, as well as LCD panels, not to mention that the US military awarded Zenith with well over $120 million in combined contracts from 1983 and 1984. So this certainly helped set things in motion for the industry. So my Zenith SuperSport here is equipped with an ADC88A-2 Intel CPU, which is clocked at 8 megahertz. It also has a 720 kilobyte floppy drive and a 20 megabyte JVC internal hard drive, which fortunately still works. It features 640 kilobytes of RAM, which I believe is also expandable. We'll take a look at the insides here shortly. I love looking at the bottom of this laptop. Thanks to all the stickers on here, it really is like looking at a little time capsule. Mad props to technician number 86 from Forsyth Computers from all the way back in 1989 for making sure this computer was in tip-top shape. If you know anything about the Forsyth Computers Company, feel free to leave a comment below. I'd love to hear from you. And on the back is the DC jack for powering the laptop directly without needing the battery. And then under the I.O. panel, you'll see a jack for plugging in an external monitor that supports CGA graphics, a standard 9-pin serial port, an LPT printer port, and another type of 25-pin port for connecting an external floppy drive as well. On the other side, we have of course the floppy drive and a standard 5-pin DIN port for plugging in a full-size keyboard. Here's that big honker of a battery. It really does have the aesthetic of an old-fashioned telephone or like a portable box phone or something. This battery is kind of unique as I've never seen one that just plugs into the computer's power jack. And on the back of it, of course, it has another DC jack that's used for charging. You can actually charge this NICAD battery without needing it to be hooked up to the computer. Now, if you were to open this up, you basically just see a bunch of D-style NICAD batteries wrapped in plastic. So it's pretty cool. Next is the power adapter itself. This one's nothing too special, but it is kind of neat. It uses a standard power cable, which is always much appreciated. I went ahead and took apart the power adapter just to check out the inside, and fortunately nothing was leaking in there, but it did have a pretty funky smell coming from the capacitors, so I'm definitely going to replace all those things. I tested it with a multimeter as well, and it is a little under voltage at the moment. It is enough to power the laptop on, but you'll see here shortly what happens. Let's go ahead and plug this in and get it powered up. And as you can see and hear, this thing looks and sounds kind of like death. There's a high-pitched squealing noise and there's quite a bit of distortion on the screen. I think a capacitor is about to pop or something. So cue the sped up disassembly footage and let's take a look at what's inside.
This thing's pretty sweet. It's the hard disk controller. I'm not totally sure on the manufacturer, as Sharp, Nikon, and Matsushita manufactured a variety of these controllers using all the same chips. On the back, now you can get a closer look at the power supply board that's inside the laptop. It also has a jack where the LCD panel plugs in. The display gets power from this board and it also passes the video signal through to the motherboard. I think this is our culprit. I'll give it a good cleaning later to see if that helps at all. And as I mentioned earlier, this computer only has 640 kilobytes of RAM, but these two ports right here, even though it looks like an IDE or disk controller of some sort, believe it or not, this is actually a RAM expansion port. There are modules available for this machine that you can just slide right in there. And according to the service manual, this should only be done by a technician. And here's that beautiful JVC 20 megabyte hard drive. Let's remove the cage and we can look at it in more detail. As you can see, here's the hard drive interface. This ain't no IDE hard drive, unfortunately. It's a 26 pin IDC hard drive, which is fairly common in laptops of the early 80s from the likes of companies like Zenith, Toshiba, Epson, and Grid. It also has some of these neat blue rubbery shock absorbers too, which might be the reason this thing has survived all these years. Looking at the bottom of the laptop again, we're going to find another little socket here for our 8087 Mathco processor chip, along with some dip switches for configuring a wide variety of system settings, like setting the number of columns on the screen. Here's a good look at the internal 2400 baud modem. This would have been pretty smoking fast for its day, as I'm sure most people were probably using a 110 or a 300 baud modem, perhaps with one of those acoustic couplers and probably on a desktop computer no doubt. Either way, this one's beautiful and it still works great, which I'll show you guys here very shortly. After much wrestling around, we can finally see the motherboard itself. Here's the iconic 8088 CPU from Intel. And luckily, there's no capacitor or battery leakage on this board, which I'm very thankful for. And I'm not going to go into detail about all of these chips, but I'd definitely encourage you to check out Eric Wasatonic's three-part series on this computer, as well as V Westlife's dual floppy drive model. So here's the interesting part. As you saw earlier, I wasn't able to get anything to show up on the screen. So after I reassembled the computer, this time I attached the battery, I plugged it in, and lo and behold, I get a little something on the display. It's still not perfect, but it's enough to get by for a quick demo. The good news is the rest of the computer seems to be working fine besides the hard drive probably being on its last legs. After talking to my electronics guru friend Tommy, we determined that the power supply board and the power adapter definitely need to be recapped, and that'll probably solve a lot of the screen distortion problems we're having. You see the battery, once it's plugged in, is actually providing enough voltage to actually get the screen to display something this time, but it's definitely temporary. It's only a matter of time before this stops working altogether. This nifty little menu program called the Office Manager loads on startup. It gives you quick access to some of the installed applications and even lets you modify the menu to add your own applications. 
You can exit to DOS and see that we're running good old version 3.3. And I was very happy to see that ProCom Plus for DOS was installed on here, which is a fantastic dial-up terminal program, which will allow us to test the modem. Another really cool little time capsule piece here is the dial directory in ProCom Plus. There was already some numbers that were programmed in here, and there's a guy named Mark in here too that the previous owner of this laptop was dialing up to. Uh, for privacy concerns, I went ahead and blacked out these numbers for right now, but still really cool to look at. Let's try dialing up to the level 29 BBS. And a big shout out to Slash R Slash Retro Battle Stations for introducing this BBS to me. I love those sweet modem sounds. The 2400 baud was interesting, as if you compare it to a 56k, there are less handshake noises. It connects a bit quicker, which is just kind of neat to me. The 2400 baud modem in general was the first modem I've ever used personally. I'd be curious to hear what yours was in the comments. And as you can see, it's working great. Now I can catch up on all my messages. All right, everybody. Well, that's all the time we have for today. Thanks so much for taking the time to watch this video on the Zenith Supersport 8088 laptop computer. It really has been a blast looking at this thing. And a big thanks to Brian Wasatonic and V Westlife for taking the initial look at this laptop a few years back. It really gave me all the information I needed to know on how to disassemble this computer and what's inside. It really has a lot of cool history behind it. So look forward to part two, where we're gonna take a look at that power supply board one more time. We're gonna recap it, and that should get this thing running like brand new again. So I'll see you guys in the next one. Have yourself a great day and take care.